Ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure of announcing to you that we are going to make an effort to repeat the old rebellion. Welcome to this episode of Cimarron's Big Guns. I'm Jamie Waite. And I'm Bryce Waite. And today we're here with actor Craig Stark. Craig, how are you? I'm great. Great. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being on our little show. So um, I hear that you and Bryce go back quite a ways. Uh, can you tell me how you two first met? Wow, that's a good question. How did we first meet? What, what was... Oh, wait. Was it... It was... It was at Pappy's, wasn't it? It was at Pappy yeah. and Harriet's, yeah, and Joshua. Right. No, well, Pioneer Town, California, right. right next, right up this hill from Yucca Valley, next to Joshua Tree. Yeah. Why don't you tell me a little bit about Pioneer Town? Because some uh, people might not be aware true. of the legacy of that town. Well, they were shooting a lot in, out at Lone Pine, mm. but so they decided to go in and build <clears throat> a fake town with the facades, you know, the fake bank and the fake. Uh, stables and it was just all fake but they built a real bar yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you need the bar to be real the, the bar was real straight out of 1880 all iron and wood and adobe and you know it's it's uh it's classic and, and owned by two friends of ours and we played in a band there every sunday well, I played every Sunday for what about seven years yeah I caught the last three right yeah yeah I when I first moved out to Joshua Tree, I went up to Pappy's on a Sunday mm -hmm. with my friend Madeline, and uh, and I caught the thrift store All Stars, and there was a guy on the stage that was just right. he was just cooler than everyone else, and he was playing like a really cool Gibson uh, hollow body guitar, sixty two, yeah. yeah, and uh, like a silver tone amp. Oh yeah, the old Sears and Roebuck sil yeah. silver tone. Yeah. This guy was just cool, and I was like, "All right, you know." And uh, after the show, I went and told, I went and told you, "Hey, you're a cool guy," you know. And he's just like, "Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of people would come up to us after that. I, that was like, "Yeah, kid, get out of here." <laughs> yeah, but a couple, a couple Not days really later, like yeah, a couple days. Really like <laughs> I wasn't that mean, was it, I? Was it, I? It, it was kind of like that. You, 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 <laughs> you, you didn't just see me and say, like, this guy's cool. Yeah, like, I was just like, hey, man. You're like, yeah, cool. You well, know. I was probably in a mood yeah. being in that band, you know? That's right, because <laughs> they, they seem like a really happy-go-lucky hippie band, but that was, that was not how it was. But anyways, yeah, yeah Craig had come back. He was going to do one last gig with them. Mm. But then uh, I went... Oh, and that's right. That was like... Okay, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I was not in a good mood because it was uh, <laughs> one of the last gigs that I was going to do, you know, uh, because of the politics and all, everything involved in the band. You know, when you get 11 or 10 or 7 or whatever it was. There's about people, 37 people yeah, on that when stage. Those, <laughs> when you get that many people together, you have a lot of varied opinions on how, uh, you know, you want to be uh, presented and do the show, and whose songs are whose, or whatever it was, you know, it was just, uh, I mean, I was, you know, I felt like I was doing time out in the desert because I had been in acting back in the 80s, um, we can get into that, but yeah. then I quit and uh, kind of got burnt on Los Angeles as one would in any big city, really, uh, and went out to Joshua Tree, and I was at the end of my tenure there, basically, when I met you. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, we, we met that night for the first time, yeah. and then I told you I play guitar and we should jam. You're like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. But it was like three days later, I was playing down the hill at a place called Water Canyon right. with uh, the Avaros. Uh, the, the, blew my mind. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> we were playing in Water Canyon, mind. and Avaro was a hot band, <laughs> and Craig is there towards the end of the night, and there's people hanging off the rafters, and we're laying it down, and uh, Craig was sitting right over in the window, and I just peeled one off, you know, I, <laughs> I went natural, I was just, you know, I called my shot, and I, I peeled one off, and after that night, Craig's like, 
Yeah, you anytime, can play anytime, man. Let's play. <laughs> let's let's jam. Let's uh, yep. let's pass the time. You know, that's what's great about an instrument. You know, I mean, I, I, the, I'm a novice, and obviously you do it for a living. But um, you know, I, I you know I didn't ever tell anyone this, but like I learned guitar out there because I mean I was already forty something. <laughs> uh, you know, going through my midlife crises out there, and. Uh, you know, learning an instrument is like good for the mind, you know, in, in the dexterity and everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, much like, you know, when you get your first gun, I mean, I remember, you know, there's a responsibility to it. And you grow up a little bit more with these things, guitar, guns, you know, there's a responsibility that you feel and there's a pride in it. And you get that when you learn more about it, mm -hmm. you know, which was amazing. And, it, you know, I, I never told anybody that, but... It, you know, I, I, I was struggling, you know, because you have to, like, fake it till you make it, you know. <laughs> but by the time I met Bryce, I knew a few chords. Let's, let's rewind a little bit. So you guys met in the desert. Yeah. But, Craig, you're from De Quincey, Louisiana, which yeah. is just on the other side of the Texas border. Yeah. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you grew up, what life was like in De Quincey? Oh, well, De Quincey, you know... Uh, small town 3,000 people I think um, you know it was like it as I remember it now it's like a dream because no one locked their doors back then it was pre-computer pre-internet pre-phones it was a community community raised us um, you know it was the typical American dream I grew up in and I am so thankful for that mm -hmm. uh, you know right across you know I guess 30 miles from the Texas border um, I kind of grew up going to Houston. That was the big town for mm -hmm. me, and because uh, New Orleans was three hours away. But um, yeah, it was idealistic. I mean, I, I, I we had you know, look, I, I don't think there was any politics that entered De Quincey during those times. Mm. You know, it was just it was carefree. You, know? yeah. you remember how the world used to be? You know? that's, how, <laughs> how it was. that's what I grew up in. And I, but I left when I was seventeen. Pretty much I was in Los Angeles. So that's kind of another American dream. Like go to LA, be an actor. Like can right. you tell us a little bit about like how you decided to do that like I know your mom runs a dance school so right. you kind of had that performance well yeah I kind of grew home. up on stage mm -hmm. uh, my mom Sandra Stark School of Dance I have to plug that <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I was on stage when I was two tap dancing and um, and I grew up on stage um, and so when I went to Los Angeles you know, it's funny, I, I never thought about being an actor. I really enjoyed, well, I can't say that. I always, you know, remembering back, the movies really influenced me. Mm -hmm. A lot of, of course, a lot of the Westerns, I didn't really know how much that was ingrained in me until I got to working in Los Angeles because a lot of, a lot of castings, you know, I got cast in a lot of Westerns. But, uh, but uh, you know, when I first got there, um, got a job with Marlon Brando, um, I was his security guard for three years, and uh, his neighbor is Jack Nicholson, and so I kind of gravitated. I don't know if you guys can notice that, but I'm busting through my. <laughs> That's kind of a style in Los Angeles. Yeah, by the way. yeah. <laughs> the kind of look, lived in look. Yeah, anyone uh, can have holes in the knees, holes yeah. in the elbows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I started working uh, at, with Marlon because somebody had crashed his gate, and I was part of a. Uh, guard program, but then I, I became more like, um, you know, more like delivery boy in those days, like go get some food, go get the groceries, go get this, go get that. But then, you know, uh, Jack Nicholson lived next door. I ended up being friends with a lady named Helena Calianotes, who's uh, an actress that was big in the 70s, uh, and she's still acting uh, in some of his more famous movies like Five Easy Pieces, Jack's, mm. Jack Nicholson's movies, but uh, built a kind of a secret club. It was a secret club back then called Helena's, which is really a famous club, but no one knows about it because we had, well, she didn't allow any paparazzi. No, I mean, we had cameras back then. Paparazzi had like big cameras, so there's nobody took pictures of the place. So it's, mm. 
it's really like a, you know a more uh, of a secret that a lot of the people knew I mean it was all stars Madonna she was our DJ her, that's when her and Sean Penn were going out and cool. and uh, you know we were just it was just a I thought I was in the middle of the universe because I was with you know all these guys and uh, all, all of them were actors Robert De Niro was there a lot and he was a favorite of mine growing up but uh, yeah you know and I sort of gravitated into acting because they got me started um, and I acted for a little bit back then in the 80s and then I quit for 20 years <laughs> and that's a whole other story but uh, yeah it was it was an amazing sort of transition from De Quincey small town to big town Los Angeles but back then it was um, it felt like a small town because there's not a lot of people there it was, mm -hmm. it was no one was there yeah. um, so it, 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 and it felt like a community with those people. It just so happened to be they were all stars. So, so I kind of grew up being kind of, uh, not blasé to it, but, you know, like, I, I've, I've seen a lot. <laughs> sure, sure. We can't go through all that. No. No. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you took a little bit of time off of acting, and uh, years, yeah. so... After we left the desert, you left the desert, I came a little bit after you, and uh, your triumphant return to acting... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was um, it was quicker than I thought it would be, you know, so I did a little film called Strutter, which is um, a film by Allison Anders, and, and it was weird because back in the 80s, my first film was with Allison Anders. So it was just like she's like my godmother of cinema, you know, and she is in a way of independent cinema. If you look her catalog up, um, Allison Anders, uh, Border Radio was the first film I did. Was the first film she did. Uh, she went on to do Gas, Food, and Lodging, was which was a big hit, mm -hmm. and then um, Grace of My Heart was about music. Um, what was the famous writing? The the Brill Building. Mm -hmm. was the famous, and it's about that building and that uh, those songwriters back in the day, which were, mm -hmm. uh, what was some of the songwriters? Oh, man. Uh, Neil, Neil Diamond. Neil Diamond. <laughs> Neil Diamond. Carol yeah. King. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, some some big-time stuff. And so that th those those were some of the films um, that I did with her, but, like, go coming back, I did the, it was a little independent film, and, Allison did a film with Quentin Tarantino uh, called Four Rooms. Uh, obviously, they knew each other. He saw some of the footage of Strutter with me in it. He brought me in to audition for uh, Django Unchained. And that was my first film with, with Quentin, Django Unchained. And then, then I went on to do The Hateful Eight and, um, and, and the, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I mean, the new film. Yep. In your theaters right now, go <laughs> we'll see it. It's a great film. It is a great film. I mean, yeah. it's really, it's really about a, a guy who um, had a western series, um, and, and I don't want to tell you too much about it, but it, it, it's, um, it, it, it's his trick. Back then, television was frowned upon, so he's trying to make his transition into films, and that's where we pick up the film. It's in 1969, where everything's changing. Uh, Old Hollywood to New Hollywood, which was Jack Nicholson and those guys, Dennis Hopper and Bruce Dern, who's in the film also. My second film with Bruce. Bruce is a legend, you know, in, yes. in, in Western films. Yeah, you know. most famously, well, to, <laughs> mi to many of our audience, he's the guy that killed John Wayne in... Uh... The Cowboys. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yep, yep. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's, he get, he gets that so much, like, you're the guy who killed John Wayne. Um, like, when I said it to him, I said, you know, my dad is still a little miffed at you for killing. <laughs> and he finished it with, you know, he, he interrupted me with, telling me it's a movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's heard it a few times. He's heard, yeah, I mean, you know, still kicking, man. Yep. Here's to Bruce. Bruce, great actor. Yeah, great actor. And uh, but you're you're a great actor too. And yeah, in the in the last three Tarantino movies, Craig is Don. Uh, very important, but like you know, 
bit parts, uh, playing like two roles per Small movie. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I play two roles in Django. And uh, one's in town, has to do with the sheriff, uh, just a guy in a crowd. And the other one is uh, one of the um, overseers uh, down at Candyland. I'm sure everyone's seen it, but you know, it's, yeah. when, it's when everyone, um, pretty much the second half of the movie, most Candyland, as I remember. Yeah, he's on a, he's on a horse, uh, like, make a line, make a line. You know, he, he's got a gnarly beard on him. Yeah. Well, that's just great. I mean, what's great about doing westerns is uh, you don't really have to get up and take a shower. You just go to work. <laughs> you know, and I, you know, I don't know if you call it method, but I like to get into the role as much as I can because I can't act. It's like you just be the role. One, you know, I'm one of those actors where you just have to, you know, stay in character the whole time. There's some actors that can talk about, you know, gardening and then going to talk about you know the posses after him right after yeah. that. but uh but yeah it, you know it, it's it, it's mostly uh you know i'm part of qt's gang like if you look in the credits in once upon a time in hollywood uh there is no gang in the in the film but in the credits that were kind of the gang that he uses over and over again mm -hmm. in each film yeah yeah that's that's amazing uh yeah yeah, it's been a blessing. Uh, I have a question about what your thoughts are on kind of this new, newer type of Western that, that Quentin's really kind of spearheaded making recently. Like, some people of, like, my father's era, you know, they are used to this other kind of... Uh, maybe idealized Western, mm -hmm. and, and things have really kind of changed with the words that they're using, mm -hmm. and some of the, you know, ethnicity of certain characters, or mm -hmm. things like that. Like, what are your thoughts being part of some of those productions? Well, I'm, look, I'm a big fan of John Ford and, and the old, old school. I was just watching some old films last night. I mean, it evolves, you know. I mean, I think the audience evolves, you have to keep up with that sophistication that the audience has at a certain period of time. Um, uh, the, the looks and uh, everything that, you know, if, you, if you're reaching, if you're doing the films as a new generation, you want to put your stamp on it, you know, mm -hmm. you want to be original, uh, you don't want to copy everything, which, you know, but I can understand the purity of it. I mean, look, I think Western started out with the Western dream of expansion, where you could go out west and dream, and then it became the iconic, you know, uh, uh, benchmarks of what how you know uh, community and adventure goes with America, and you know, let's face it, our, our moral values, and then it gets into a little bit where there's you know, you you have to, I guess, forgive some of the things that have been portrayed. You know, um, because, you know, we're understanding more about the plight of the Native American Indians and stuff like that. I mean, that was starting to come along in the 70s, too, you mm -hmm. know, with Little Big Man. It's one of my favorite films. Yep. It's, it's, it's a comedy. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it shows, you know, them more, uh, you know, Native Americans more as human beings, you know, and, instead yeah. of just iconic identity. You know, I, I hate identity politics now. I think people are more than what the audience sees the iconic vision of. You're bringing a little bit more of humanity to mm -hmm. the characters now. Yeah. Which, you know, John Wayne and those guys were doing that too, but it was a simpler time. Let's well, face it's it. always been allegory. Uh, Westerns yeah. have always been a great canvas for allegory. And yeah, with, with John Ford Westerns, which. That's not really ground zero. Like no. Western started off silent films. This was the first, some of the first films ever made is just like a close up on a cowboy just mugging and pointing his gun at you. And people screamed. Yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah. he ran away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to these uh, serial westerns, uh, people just riding around uh, Vasquez, just like you know, yeah, just firing off guns silently, you know, and then Gene Autry, like the singing cowboys, like the... Uh, romanticized. Yeah, really thing. romanticized, clean. Uh, Wrong then, period guns in a lot of them. Yeah, that's hard. <laughs> yeah. Our audience, you guys probably know so much about guns that it's ruined some westerns. Yeah. And yeah, I, I went through that a couple years ago. It was, it's a bummer. Yeah. But yeah, like John Ford, you know, in a, a lot of his movies, you are dealing with some pretty... Heavy subjects. Uh, searchers. Yeah, Searchers is really heavy. It takes on some stuff. Uh, Sergeant Rutledge? 
you know, you get to John Ford and and it it's more you know, some of that like with the searchers is dealing with like uh what was a family member that had been uh kidnapped by Native Americans and John Wayne didn't want anything to do with her at uh, wow. Well, she, he was Natalie obsessed. Wayne, he was obsessed with tracking them down and getting revenge. But he was also, if she was still alive, he was going to kill her because of, right? You know, be, because of she had been tainted. Yeah, yeah. The, it, it, it was a really stuff. heavy subject, and uh, you know, and, and then at the end, in his the character end. arc. Yeah, he doesn't do it. He just carries her out. And well, see, that's what you know. A lot of criticisms are thrown at movies because um, uh, of. Of some, some subject matter and stuff, but you know, like a good film always has retributions for, you know, consequences for what the characters are doing. Yeah. And 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 that's the growth of a character through a film, and whether you're learning lessons and, and it's a new sort of sophisticated thing for the audience at that time to bear that kind of subject matter which was shocking you know it's like the gun was pointing at the audience that was shocking yeah and you get to that point that's shocking and then you get to a point where you know in the 70s where um, you know like there's a lot of civil war stuff that's being brought to you know where there's sides of the country yeah. I mean, westerns are dealing with hard subject matters that are subtle that people don't really realize, but like it's it's been some of our most influential films. Yeah, westerns. Yeah. It rolls with it. It reinvents it's, itself. It's America. Yeah, it's America. Uh, yeah, the fifties westerns turn into TV westerns, which almost killed the western, and then. Well, there was hardly any dirt. Yeah, yeah, it, they were clean. The clothes were really nice. Fifties uh, television. Yeah, was, uh, yeah, clean. It was clean. Yeah, and then. Then it goes to Italy, and right. you get a completely different perspective. You get anti-heroes. You have a lot of the same subject matter because Sergio Leone, big fan of John Ford. Yeah. Big fan of all those things, but changing this perspective, and it gave new life to the genre. Then you okay. come over here, you get the Peck and Pot Western. Well, you know? I don't want to skip Anthony Mann. He had some... You know, he had real situations of men growing up in the West, uh, it, like you know, especially like men at the end of their, um, you know, like the the West was shaped by these men, and they have to give it up. Yeah. And and, and then we come into the you know the, a lot of that with seventies and stuff. I mean, you're dealing with some subject matter that that you know goes beyond the genre. Um, you know, de dealing with deep down issues of people and their politics and how they evolve with their lives and, uh, you know, coming up to the modern Western where, you know, I mean, let's face it, a lot of females have been like one stereotypical thing for a long time and then, you know, you get the Westerns where there's a... Uh, with the Sharon Stone Western. <laughs> yeah, you know. Quick and the Dead. Quick, Quick and the Dead, Quick which, uh, <laughs> Phil Reed, my buddy, Doing all the gun training in that movie. Uh, and Craig, you've worked with Val, right? Many times. Mm -hmm. yeah. On Django, on The Hateful Eight. Uh, I mean, he's been there, I think he was even once upon a time. He was mm -hmm. there. Um, yeah, I mean, he's done, he's a legend, right? He did Tombstone, he did 310 to Yuma. He, yeah. He's, if I was making a Western, which uh, I haven't yet, but I'm about to. <laughs> Phil would be my guy, and he'd be on it too. Uh, yeah, he's he's fantastic. I mean, I love the genre. I love the way that the genres evolved. But uh, Jamie really grew up with a lot of westerns, probably more than I did. And uh, her perspective of the western was that it, they're very rapey. <laughs> it's not <laughs> a cool you know, time for women. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that it's not true. It, yeah. It's just hard to watch sometimes as a woman. Yeah, uh, you know, I would, I would watch certain, you know, some of my favorite movies, I'd watch uh, High Plains Drifter, and there's a scene like, okay, I can see why you don't like this. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, once you get past that part, it's a great movie. It's a great movie, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, yeah. You know, I mean, that, that's funny, because, you know, like, just recently, uh, you know, we, I don't think they, I don't know what's happening with financing with movies, because it's very complicated. 
something I can't explain. But, um, you know, they were trying to get on an all-girl Western where there was, um, um, you know, a, a group of gals that had, had a lot of do stuff done to them and they were getting their revenge. Um, With the girl that's in some horror movies that we like? Yeah, and... Uh, um, Laura Dern? Yeah, Laura Dern. Laura Dern's in it, yeah. yeah. Uh, directed by a good friend of mine, Courtney Hoffman. Oh, the good, good Time, time Girls, Girls, yeah. Um, I don't know if it, in the end if that, that's going to be the cast because it, it all changes. Because sometimes what we do is we do proof of concepts where we have to shoot a film and then go show it to the um, money people to see uh, you know how we're going to allocate the money. Um, but I think it's in development at, at some studio with her. I, don't quote me on that, but it, you know, it's very complicated when it gets down to that. But it, we're going towards that, you know, where there is some, you know, retribution and some, and, and, and some more uh, storylines with women and showing up more humanity in what they've gone through. I mean, as I remember, there was a Clint Eastwood movie where the girl did get raped and the whole movie is about... Unforgiven. Yeah. Yeah, unforgiven. Of course, yeah. the unforgiven, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, when you said that, it's, it, it hit me because I never really thought about that, you know, mm -hmm. until you said that. But, yeah, you know, I think there's a lot of stories with female, fe female characters in the West that have not been told. Because, yeah. Well, so, yeah, there's a difference between cinema and real life, yeah. which there should be. Yeah. And, uh, Down you know, the dirt. like my, my perception is when you guys are. Yeah, down to the dirt. Like, so you're telling me in a movie, when some guy has a dirty face, you're telling me that's not real dirt? Well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, dirt <laughs> doesn't really, uh, you know, it doesn't really stay on your face like, you know, like you want it to. I mean, there's stuff that they make, because everything's timely and... You know, and, and, and everything has a look. Like I remember in Django, they, ma they made up their own dirt for Django, which is elements of makeup and stuff, mm -hmm. because it'll stay on you all day. Mm -hmm. Because they can't go and retouch you. I mean, they can retouch you a little bit, what they call last looks before the camera uh, rolls. People will come up and do last looks, but that's not applying, you know, your basic Western dirt. Right. You know, you, you, you wear through the day. And, you know, as a small part guy, maybe if you're a star, they may do something a little bit more elaborate on the last touch-up. But I have to be camera ready most of the time. And um, that's putting on this, I don't even know if you'd call it dirt, it's makeup mixed up with other things. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah, know it's like what a it fine is. black powder. Yeah, like yeah. Mm -hmm. you put it on and you kind of rub it in and you have like what looks to the camera is like you've been on a horse for weathered. Yeah, <laughs> 15, 20 days weathered, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, Sergio Leone had a pretty interesting look for his stuff. They would have like a thick, almost like brown grease paint on everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you get that shine. It yeah. just feels claustrophobic and sweaty. Yeah, and yeah. Makes your eyes really pop. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. through all that mess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, we wrapped up filming this uh, new Cimarron commercial. Uh, Craig was... You were great in it. Thank you for coming out here. And, uh, you oh, know, it's pleasure. great to finally get you in Texas. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going to move here. <laughs> Uh, how can people uh, track you down online? Uh... Oh, probably the best way is Instagram, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, it's Craig Stark, at C-R-A-I-G-S-T-A-R-K, underscore. Um, you can get a hold of me on Instagram. Follow, you know, I usually post up pictures when I'm going through production, so if you want to know what's going on. I'm on Facebook, too, but I'm like, a, they have friends limits and all that stuff. So come on over to Instagram, Craig Stark underscore. All right. Well, thank you, Craig Stark, and thank you guys for watching. Until next time. Cimarron is recognized as the leader in quality and authenticity in replica firearms. Hey, kid, never sneak up on a man's camp. Sorry, part. I smelled that coffee in. Hey, is that a Cimarron? For those who know the difference, what's it to you? I've got a Cimarron too. It's got superior fit and finish. The highest standards. Cimarron is the choice for you. Tell your dealer, I want a Cimarron.